Keep podcast, podcast. Keep doing what you do, doing what you do. Keep making these podcasts. Stay nice, stay nice. I'm just trying to say only be speedy, speedy. I'm just trying to say only be speedy, speedy. I'm just trying to say only be like I was your podcast. Is y'all not doing nothing for the black community, right? You know, I'm just trying to say niggas over here, we ain't got no R spec. We ain't got no R spec. R spec. We ain't got no R spec. We ain't got R spec. We ain't got no R spec. Ain't got no data mapper. R spec. We ain't got no R spec. We ain't got test units. Anyways, I wanted to. I, I figured, you know, it's nice when speakers have, you know, a, a entrance song or something. And I'll, what would be my entrance song? <laughs> eh, we ain't got no R spec. Anyways, uh, my Twitter name is Greg Pollock. In case you guys uh, want to say anything about or have any comments about uh, this talk, and the hashtag you can use for this talk is on the edge of Rails performance. RubyConf09. Oh my God. WTF. BBQ. Ha 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 ha. You get extra points if you actually get. It. But uh, anyways, before I get into uh, Rails performance. Um, I wanted to share uh, a little, a couple discoveries that I had last night. How many guys go to the startup crawl? Yeah, everyone went. That was awesome. So we had a couple discoveries along the way, which I thought I would share with you. They'll, they'll be in a bigger video, which we're putting together for the uh, like summarizing the conference. But there was a few discoveries, starting with uh, Pivotal Labs. The first really cool thing we saw over there was they have you know a build board for all the different projects, so you can kind of see the status of the builds and are they you know. Are they all in the green? Are they red? Are they building? That was kind of cool. The second cool thing we saw at Pivot Labs was their awesome whiskey collection. <laughs> <clears throat> you wonder, it's like, okay, maybe like if all the projects turn green, everyone has a shot or something. I don't know. Or you sip. Everyone has a sip. You don't shoot whiskey. I learned that at Pivot Labs. Okay, so uh, next up, we checked out Dropbox. And one of the cool things we saw at Dropbox was that the CEO, this guy, has like four screens vertical, which was kind of cool, until you realize he's using Windows and he's got like all his stuff around here, along with his deodorant and everything else. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to uh, turn down the lights a little bit, because I'm gonna be showing you guys a lot of screencasts. So it'll be easier to see. Okay, that'll be a little better. And uh, the other thing at Dropbox, totally unexpected, is the, the CEO turns to us and he says, this desk over here, that's Zed Shaw's desk. Zed Shaw. And we, were kind of, we kind of looked at the desk and we kind of looked at each other. Take a moment to think, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> Given the opportunity. It was tempting. But um, yeah, you know, Zed Shaw, that guy up there. So uh, I thought it was a little disappointing he wasn't there at his desk, because I would have got him to autograph his book. <laughs> In case you can't see it up at the top, it's, this is the subtitle up at the top. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I figured, well, another thing I thought about was, this was Dropbox. So if I really wanted, I could drop something on his box. <laughs> but no, we didn't do anything, ba we didn't do anything bad. Um, luckily, though, uh, Nathaniel Bibbler, who does the Ruby 5 with me, got a great idea as we were walking out. Because we love this application, Gowalla. Anybody here Gowalla know what that is? Cool. It, it's an iPhone application. Basically allows you to sort of like a virtual geocaching, where you walk around and you can check in at places, right? And so you basically, you know, you might call up your iPhone app, and like these are all the close places around you. And you could press one of those, and then you could see who else has checked in. You could check in here and like leave items and that sort of stuff. And so uh, Nathaniel got this bright idea. Hey, let's create a, uh, an I, a place for Zed Shaw's desk. <laughs> like a little, 
you know, it's, it, it's a, a monument there, you know, in, in San Francisco. So if you're walking down the streets of San Francisco, you might see, like, oh, look, Zed Shaw's desk. I'll check in, right? <laughs> um, and what's really cool about this is when you create something on Gowalla, you have to categorize it. And Nathan found the perfect category for it. It's an antique, <laughs> like Zed Shaw. Uh, yeah, anyway, so that's, uh, that was sort of some discoveries from the startup crawl. But this talk is about scaling rails. Um, but earlier this year, I released a bunch of screencasts um, on scaling rails. Any of you guys watch any of these? A bunch of you guys, very cool. Um, and so for this talk, as I said in the description, I want to really briefly go over what we've covered already. Because a lot of the stuff I'm going over today is advanced stuff. You guys already have Rails apps. You're looking for ways to optimize them. But in case you're just getting started with that, here's scaling Rails in 60 seconds. First of all, the first thing you want to do to scale your Rails application is work on page responsiveness. This is front-end responsiveness. Install YSLO, get it running on your page, and optimize using what it tells you to do, like you know, um, compress your CSS and JavaScript files together. Next up, page cache as much as you can. If you can't do that, then you do action caching. If you can't do that, then you do fragment caching. And you can't do that, you do object caching. And if you don't know what any of these means, well, we'll go watch the screencast. Um, cache expiration sucks, just in general. Avoid it as much as you can. Luckily, Rails comes with all this stuff built in, so it's very friendly with memcached. And with memcached, if you program in a certain way, you never have to worry about cache expiration. So that's sort of a something you might look into. Also, um, scaling, uh, use background process, processes, delay as much work as you can. Some of this might be obvious to you guys, so anything that takes, say, longer than 500 milliseconds, put it on a background processor. Um, Client-side caching, this is where you deal with e-tags and last modified. And with Rails 2.2, we got a lot of little keywords and methods that help us do this. Um, next up, don't pre-optimize. So what I'm talking about here is that 99% of the time, you're going to need zero of everything that I just talked about, right? So when you start out a project, some people make the mistake of trying to cache too early, optimize too early. And really, if you're worried about caching, set aside some time at the end of your project to do load testing and make sure it scales. And that's when you need to figure out. At that point, you can figure out what you need to do for caching. Um, and then lastly, and this theme will come up many times during the talk, which is don't abuse your database. Because that's sort of like the number one thing you can do wrong with your Rails app. So let's get to the cool stuff. That was scaling Rails in 60 seconds. Um, so a couple months ago, I started up this podcast called Ruby 5, which covers the latest news in the Ruby community um, twice weekly. And while doing this, um, I came upon a lot of Ruby libraries and gems specifically for helping you scale your Ruby or you know, your Rails application. And so um, what I'm going to go over, so, so the talk really, at this point forward, could definitely be called Ruby and Rails libraries that just might save your ass. So um, it looks a little bit something like, um, like this. So we're going to be going over nine different libraries and plugins, um, showing you guys a bunch of screencasts. First, we're going to look over active record plugins for database optimization, Rails plugins to help prevent memory bloat, and then lastly, Ruby libraries to help scale. And this last bit, this is like the most interesting bit at the end. So I highly encourage you guys to stick around. Um, so first up. The bullet library. The bullet library helps you reduce the number of queries with alerts. And don't worry about scribbling this all down. I'll show you guys the URL at, that I showed at the beginning, which will give you links to all of this sort of stuff. It's cool. So let's take a look at the bullet library. Um, do, do you guys, uh, guys in the back, do you know if there's any way we can turn off some of these? Um, so, <laughs> so basically, I have a, um, here's my view. I'm basically iterating through all the different posts. And I'm doing post.user.name. So I'm getting the author of each of these posts. So let's go ahead and uh, run the server. And you can see when I refresh this, oh, hey, check that out. Bullet gave me a growl notification that's saying n plus 1 query detected. So it's basically saying, hey, you might want to add include. Awesome, thank you. And if we look at our logs, we can even see it tells us which line of code this actually was triggered on. So we can see now we've got post.user.name. Now, so what I want to do is I'm going to add include. And now it's a refresh. Oh, hey, now we added include as it recommended we do. And now we don't get that growl notification anymore. 
The cool part about Growl is it works, works both ways. If you're using an include that you don't necessarily need, now that I took it out, oh, it says, oh, hey, you've got unused eager loading. So you might want to remove include. OK, so that's cool. Shows me when I don't need to use include. Um, the next thing I want to show you guys with bullet is I'm going to go ahead and add uh, comments, a comment count after each post. So I want to show all of the comments for each post. So I'm going to do post.comments.size for each one, which is going to trigger a query for each, each post, which isn't good. Bullet's going to recognize that. And it says, hey, you might want to add a counter cache here. Cool. So that's Bullet. So that's the first plugin we're going to look at. Um, it just allows you to help you, know, help you reduce the number of queries with alerts. And what's neat is if you're not on Windows, you might not have Growl. By default, it's going to uh, use a JavaScript alerts if you don't have Growl built in with, with uh, Mac. So next up, oh, hey, now it's time for a pop quiz. Here's, oh, <laughs> I just gave you the answer to the pop quiz. <laughs> What's missing from this migration? An index. An index, right. As uh, Rails developers, we're not always that good at remembering to add all the indexes we need. And I'm not just talking about like foreign keys like this. I'm talking about indexes based on what we're querying upon, right? So if somewhere in my code I search on title, then I'm going to want an index on title. Well, how do we then look over code bases and figure out where we might be missing indexes? Well, here's one solution by Eled Midar called Rails Indexes, which basically gives you two different rake tasks, which we're going to run now on our application. So first I'm going to do is I'm going to install the plugin. Now I'm going to do rake show me a migration. And what it's going to do is it went and looked at all of my models, all my relationships, looked into my database to see which foreign keys were actually in my database, and recommended that I add this foreign key. So it basically gives me a migration. But like I said before, that's all, not all the types of indexes we need. What about when we have like find by title? Well, that's what the second rake task is for. The second rake task goes through all of my controllers in my views and looks at my find queries, and based upon that, give some recommendations for some foreign keys, for some indexes. And I'm going to go ahead and show you guys, if I go ahead and change the code, so you can actually see that this works, I'm going to say find by title and published. And if I rerun it, I can see, sure enough, it gave me a composite index. Cool. So this is just two rake tasks you can run on your Rails app if you think you might be missing indexes. Next library I want to show you guys is Scrooge. Any of you guys use Scrooge before? One? Cool. So let me show you why we might need Scrooge in our application. So in the examples that I showed you guys, we've got a post table. And a post has all of these different columns. And in my controller, I'm calling post.all, which is basically doing a query which looks like this. But this obviously isn't the most efficient way um, to run a query for the page that we were rendering before. Because in the page we were rendering, we weren't even showing the body of the post. So really, the most optimal query that we might want to run is something that looks more like this, which only pulls the data that we might display on the page. So obviously, if you wanted to follow this methodology, you could go into all your code and you could add the select option to all your find methods, but that's not totally optimal. That's where Scrooge comes in. So let's give it Scrooge a try. So obviously, there in my post controller, I've got post.all. Cool. And as you can see, that without the Scrooge plugin, it's going to do select star from post, get all the posts, when in reality we might not need all that data. So now I'm going to install the Scrooge plugin. And now this time, the first time I refresh the page, 
Scrooge is in the discovery phase. It's basically doing something down here. We see it, say, post-Scrooge, doing all this stuff. It's learning. It's learning which items I need in that page. And the second time I refresh, I apologize for you guys in the back. I know there's a dead zone down here. Um, it's only going to query for the columns that I need, only the ones that I need. So the cool thing about this is it also works with relationships. Let's take a look. So we include the user item table, post.user.name, so we're referencing the relationship. Now the first time I refresh this, it again is doing a discovery, so it's figuring out which columns are being used in this page, and getting all the user information, but we don't need all of that. We don't want to pull the password. All we really care about is the name and ID, which is what it pulls the second time that page gets loaded. So as you can imagine with the Scrooge plugin, if you're, is it really, with this sort of application, it's not going to make that big of a performance difference, but if you're pulling like, you know, hundreds of objects, tons of data, you know, you've got um, tables that have tons of columns with lots of data in them, this could really shave off some milliseconds off of each request. So something worth taking a look at. So that's Scrooge. Up next, we've got a couple plugins to prevent bloat. Uh, oops, let me go back. So a couple weeks ago, Sudara Williams wrote this blog post on the Engine Yard blog where he started talking about that it's not memory leak, it's bloat. Because this guy works for Engine Yard. He, you know, it's working, he troubleshoots Rails apps on a daily basis and sees that people sometimes have a misconception that the reason why these mongrels on the server are bloated, why they're, you know, 150 megs of RAM, is that Ruby's leaking all over the place, right? Which is a big misconception. What he finds most of the time, the reason why these Ruby mongrels are bloating is because they're instantiating thousands of active record objects. That's usually where people abuse, you know, active record, which is something that you see over and over again. So he recommended three different tools in his blog post to help you not run into this situation, which I'm going to show you now. The first thing he recommended was Rackbug by Brian Helmkamp. Any of you guys using Rackbug? A few more people. Cool. Well, I'm going to give you guys a real quick demo. So first we're going to install the plugin. And by the way, all these screencasts um, since Thursday are now available on the Scaling Rail screencast. So you can get access to all these if you want to go back and look at them later. They're all online. So um, Rackbug is a piece of middleware, which means you're going to have to be using Rails 2.3 or higher to take advantage of it. We're going to add it as a config middleware, so insert it into our middleware stack. I'm going to give it two more items, two more options. The first one is so that I can secure the uh, rack bug. It's going to be my password. And the second one is so that I can actually run database queries, which you'll see me do a little bit later. So let's go ahead and start up my server. Cool. Now the first thing we need to do before we start using rack bug is install the bookmarklet. Let me go to the secret URL, which it tells you about in the readme. And from there, I can just drag this link up to my browser and turn it into a bookmarklet. Once I have it there, I can go back into my app and I can hit the bookmarklet, type in my password, and it gives me a bunch of information about the request which just happened. First up, it gives me the milliseconds that it took to render the request, the CPU time, system time, total CPU time. Next up, under rack env, it shows me a bunch of environment variables. This is, you know, if we do a flash, if we have cookies, any sort of environment variables that get thrown back and forth between the server and the browser, you can see right here. We can also see that it did 10 queries, which took 22 milliseconds up at the top of the page. We can see that query breakdown. If we scroll over to the right, we can see exactly where in our code that uh, query was triggered from. So in this case, it was line six, the post controller. I can actually execute that query against my database to figure out exactly what it's returning so I can quickly debug. Um, I can even um, explain the query to make sure it's using the right indexes. So it's all right there in the browser. 
And this is, uh, you know, something that I, we took, I think, from a Django slightly, right? This, they have the Django toolbar. This is our toolbar. Um, we can see that uh, how many active record objects were instantiated for this request. So obviously, if this was in the couple hundreds, maybe even thousands, that would not be good. Might want to refactor. I get cache usage, usage. So if I'm using any cache on this page, it'll tell me which cache was used, um, which templates got rendered, and how long they took to render. Um, I can look straight into the log file, which is awesome, especially if I'm running this on my staging server. So I don't have to go to the staging server and look in the log for the request. I can just hit the log here and see exactly what it printed out in the log. Very convenient. And the last bit of information up in the top right is showing me something really interesting. First, it's showing me the Ruby process which rendered this page is currently occupying 35 megabytes. And from the time that it started processing this request to the time that it ended this request and sent it back, it increased in memory usage by four kilobytes. It's great information to know. If you see that this gets jumped up you know, by 20, 30, 50 megabytes every time you hit this page, it might be time to refactor. Which leads us to memory logic, which is one of these uh, libraries which will help you figure out um, you know, which actions are bloating, where in your code you're getting memory bloat. So let's jump into memory logic. and see what it does. So I just installed the plugin. I have to do a little bit of configuration to get memory logic working. Just add a little bit to the top of our application controller. And this is, uh, this is all the stuff that I'm doing is in the readme. And if I run my server, now I'm going to click around a little bit. I can look back at my log now and see that it has some additional information listed after each item. Take a look at that. So basically, after each line, it's telling me the process which is rendering this action, here is the current memory footprint. All right. So I, if I'm getting some bloat on an action, I can go step by step to see where I started getting bloated. Like oh, At what point in the code? Okay, right after it ran this query, what happened? I even have the process ID, which is really convenient. So if I'm looking at, say, like New Relic RPM, and I can see that, oh yeah, this one process went out of control, I can dive into my server. Okay, what's the process ID on this one that's taking you know, 150 meg of RAM right now? Grab that process ID, jump into the production log file, and then quickly search on that process ID and figure out what exactly happened step by step. Cool. And that leads us to oink. All right. So oink, you know, we got to figure out where our Ruby process is hogging memory, oink. So um, yeah, so this takes it a step further and builds upon memory logic. Let me show you what that means. Got to do a little bit of configuration to get this one going too. So now if I take a look at my logs, it's giving me a little bit the same information from memory logic, but a little more organized. So it tells me memory usage for this um, current request is 34 meg, process ID, and the instantiation breakdown. So the number of active record objects which are getting instantiated. We also saw that on Rackbug, on our Rackbug toolbar, but this time it's printing out in our log. Now where Oink starts to get interesting is when you start, um, it has some, it lets you do some metrics on your actions to figure out which ones are the biggest hogs. So to, to do this, first we have to, I had realized you had to add some, uh, change your logging syntax to use the Hodel 3000 compliant logger, so I'm going to add that in there. And now I'm going to run my server. And obviously from this point we want to start collecting data because we want some metrics, so um, I'm going to click around. I mean, in reality, of course, you'd run this on your production server and start collecting data on your production server. And now we can start running some metrics. We're going to run script oink, and we're going to give it a threshold. We're going to say, look at all the actions that increased memory by more than 75 megabytes. 
And obviously, this is just development. This is a demo, so there was none. So I'm going to change the threshold to something really small, just to zero. So it went through, looked at everything in our logs, and figured out which ones are the worst requests that increased memory the most. So at one point in time, the post controller increased memory by 486 kilobytes, 286 kilobytes. So I can figure out really quickly you know, where I might need to refactor, which actions are taking the most memory, increasing memory the most. And then down here at the bottom, it aggregates so you can see the worst actions. Now, in reality, if you ran this on a real Rails app, you might get results that look a little bit more like this. So I can see here that I've got a request, uh, the worst request, increased memory by 157 megabytes. That's bad, right? And the next worst and the next worst, and down here it's aggregating. So I can tell, OK, I might want to refactor the dashboards controller because that doesn't look so good. It's uh, increasing memory by a lot. Cool. So we've reached the last section of this talk where I've got three more libraries to talk to you about Ruby libraries that can help you scale. And this is sort of a smorgasbord, a couple different libraries. The first one is called Rubber by Matthew Conway. And this you can think of as a replacement for Chef with Chef Deploy. It basically allows you to deploy a cluster into EC2 really, really easily. Let me show you what it looks like. So the first thing I do when I'm running, um, when I'm running this is I vulcanize when I'm running rubber. So this is going to create some scaffolding. So you think of it as scaffolding for me. And vulcanize, if in case you're not, you don't figure out the connection. Vulcanize is what you do to rubber to harden it, I guess. So we're going to harden, harden it. And we can specify here which components do we want in our EC2 cluster. Cool. And uh, one uh, sort of aggregate uh, cluster that we can create that's set up for us by default, we can say complete passenger MySQL, which gives us all these components. We wanted to add, say, Sphinx. We could say script generate vulcanize Sphinx. We wanted to add our own custom generator. We could do that as well. So once you do that, what it does is it goes into your Rails app, and it's going to add a new directory inside your config directory called rubber. And that's got a couple things inside of it. First, it has your deploy information. These are all your Capistrano tasks for all of your different components. So you can see Apache, HA proxy, Monit. So these are all the Capistrano tasks to deploy those items. And down below, you've got your YAML files. This is just your configuration. Um, yeah. So if we opened up one of these directories over here, if we opened up the role directory inside Rubber, we would start seeing some, things that, uh, some, some files we recognize. Like you see, we've got this my.cnf. And it looks like a monit script as well. If we looked inside of that, here's what we would see. We can see that it's populating uh, from our YAML file some configuration items. And then it's actually going to render this as an ERB file into our MySQL configuration file before it gets deployed on our server. Cool. So let me show you the, uh, the, the secret sauce here. If I go ahead and run these Capistrano tasks on my server, on, you know, once I have Rubber installed in my Rails app, you can see this is basically creating a bunch of different uh, items for me, different roles. Um, out of the box, it's going to give me a complete cluster in EC2 after a couple lines. And what's really cool is the guy that created this it was really smart. System administration guy has a ton of stuff built in. So you've got, like by default, you've got database backups going on. You've got Monit monitoring your services. You've got uh, Moonin, all these stuff, like sort of an optimal you know, uh, cl uh, cluster of servers working for you. So yeah, it also has dynamic DNS updates, which is great. So if you want to do a new deploy, you could just deploy to an entirely new EC2 cluster, right? Change the DNS automatically. You could have it do that automatically in your Capistrato task. Kill the old cluster. It has built-in backups, like I said. So sort of like best practices for deployment. Easy staging. One of the really cool things about this is that, that when I talked to the guy that created this uh, gem, he said that in their project where they have this, if any of the developers ever need to show off a feature, well, they deploy to EC2. They, they start up a staging instance. And the awesome thing about that is that staging instance has the exact con same configuration of their production instance. It's just on one box instead of many. right? And it just makes it so easy to spin up new instances. Oh, we're going to show off a feature to a client. OK, we'll just spin up a new staging server. I'll run one Capistrano command, go. I'll throw it away afterwards. That's kind of neat. Um, you've got Monit built in, which does all your process monitoring. 
And like I said, you have Moonin to do all of your stats across all of your boxes. Um, so that's rubber. Um, what's great about that, what's kind of neat, is it keeps deployment a first-class citizen. So because you're putting all of your configuration file files for your cluster right there in your Rails app in these directories, well, all of your configuration management is in source control, which is awesome. It's right there in your Rails app. It kind of feels good to just have it right there in your Rails app. There's something cool about that. Um, it's also very scalable by default. Obviously, you want to add another server, you just you know change a small configuration line and redeploy your cluster. Cool, so that's that one. Now I'm going to be talking about CloudCrowd a little bit, um, which is a background processor, which is really neat. Um, a simple background processor. So these guys from Document Cloud had this problem, and really they, they have this problem in their new application that they're developing for journalists. Basically, journalists are going to be sending them PDFs, big PDFs, and they need a background process, which will hopefully use sort of like a MapReduce-like like function to take that PDF, split it up, get images of those PDFs, strip the text off of them, and then combine them all together. So kind of like Scribd, where you know, they'll take a PDF and sort of just you know, put that onto the web. And uh, that's obviously they have a background process, and these guys need a background process too. So out of this, they created Document Cloud to do this for them. So here's the anatomy of their application, of, their, of Document Cloud. So we've got an application or website. It needs to start a job, maybe to parse a PDF. That's going to send a request to a central server. That's going to have some sort of database. Could be MySQL, could be SQLite. That's going to dispatch some work to what we're going to be calling nodes. Those nodes might have workers that do work for them. Once those are complete, it's going to save those files to S3, notify the central server that the results are done, and that can send that back to the user. So this is basically the anatomy of a cloud crowd cluster, and also probably many other database you know, background processors. Let's go ahead and run it, though, because this is where it starts to get really cool. So I'm going to create a uh, Cloud Crowd application. So I just do this uh, install. And basically, this gives me a couple files. First, it gives me a rack file. So this is going to be my um, server, my central server that's going to be monitoring the processes. And I can do some customizations in here. I can specify the number of workers that I want. I can specify the storage. And here, since I'm in development, I'm just going to use a file system. Now I can say what sort of database I want to use. I can use MySQL by default, or in this case, since I'm just playing with it, I'm going to use SQLite. Cool. And now I need to create my database, which is going to hold my background processing, my jobs. Cool. And now I'm going to go ahead and start up the central server. And here's where it really starts to get cool. Check out this uh, UI. So this is running on thin. Start it up, and here's sort of the UI that you get for Cloud Crowd. On the left, it can tell us all of the worker nodes. We don't have any yet. On the right, we can see all the work units in the queue. Notice that it's updating. It's doing polling, so it can see what's in the queue at any point in time. I can see the jobs in the queue and uh, what they're doing. And I can see active nodes and workers. So it comes with this really nice interface, which I'll show you. I'll sh we'll check it out in action. So let's, let's make this background processor do some work. First thing we need to do is start up a node. We need a node so they can do some work. So we say crowd node. And if we go back to our website, we can say, hey, yeah, look, OK, we've got a node here that's ready for work. So let's give it some work. So we can see that it comes with, by default, a couple actions that we can do. We can do some graphics magic processing. We can process PDFs. Or we can do a word count. Let's do a word count. So here you can see we have to have a, a process action and a merge action. Process is just going to do WC and count the number of words in whatever URL I send in. And then merge is going to sum up all the counts of all of the documents that I send in. And I'm adding a sleep five to delay it just so you guys can see it in process. Otherwise, it would be too quick. So cool. So how do I, how do I start that action? Well, I simply do a REST post request to jobs. I say do the word count action. And I send it a bunch of inputs. And all these different inputs, these are just basically Shakespeare plays. So I wanted to count all the words in all these Shakespeare plays. So it's just going to do a quick request. So let's go ahead and start that. As soon as I start that, I can go over and look at the, oh, hey, look. So now we've got five nodes all doing work. I can click on one and see exactly what it's doing. 
you can see, oh, we're 23% complete. We can see exactly you know, how an hour 41% complete, it's running. We look over at the graph, we can see it started out with 23 work units in the queue and it's slowly processing them using the five nodes that it has. Down here we can see the number of jobs in the queue, there's just one, and so, hey, we're complete. Pretty cool. So now to figure out the status of how it w w did it complete successfully, I happen to know the job that we ran would have got the ID of one. If I go to slash one, I get in JSON that it succeeded. It took 21 seconds, and there's 558,804 <laughs> words in all of those Shakespeare documents that I had at count. Actually, like, ta-da! <laughs> um, so that's Cloud Crowd. Why is Cloud Crowd interesting? Well, it's all in Ruby, and they made it so it's going to be very simple and hackable. The disadvantage of using something, um, using a, you know, a different background processor like Gearman or um, what's the new hotness? What are we? Like Rescue, what's the, what's that? Or like, what's that? Oh, like, no, not like, not like Nanite, because Nanite's like, sort of like Ruby too. But the disadvantage of using these, these really sort of robust background processors that you see people like Facebook using is that these are all in C. So you're gonna be, if you ever need to hack them and make them behave a little bit differently, you're going to have to learn C. These guys from scratch wanted to create, keep it under 2,000 lines and make it very hackable. So I have the confidence in knowing that if I add this as a background processor and I ever want to dig down in the code, I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm going to be able to make it do exactly what I need it to do. And there's some sort of good feeling that comes from knowing that the code that you know, is part of my system, I can go in and I can hack if I need to. So that's sort of the benefit of Cloud Crowd. Cool. Now we're down to the last bit, which is good because I get to rant. I get to do a little bit of rant on email because there's two problems with doing email in any Rails app that really suck. And I'm sure there's a few of you guys that really feel my pain. The first thing that sucks about doing email in Rails is mailing lists. Every client that comes to you inevitably needs a white list or some sort of subscription list so that when people sign up, they can say, yeah, send me the newsletter, send me occasional discounts on lab tests, and you've got to maintain who's subscribed, who's unsubscribed, maybe even built in the ability to send out mass emails or at least export to CSV or something, right? And that sucks because you end up having to do that over and over again sometimes. The other thing that really sucks about email is client changes. Because in Rails, all of our HTML, all of our emails here are inside of our Rails app. So every time the client wants a change, they have to go to you, the developer, and say, oh hey, you know, ch could you change this grammar for me or could you change this one line of text? It really sucks that me as a developer, you know, that I have to deal with that, that I have to do that work, that, that sucks. It's too bad there isn't a way that I could maybe not do that. Well, there is a way. There's hope for dealing with these two different things. Um, and there's several different ways you could deal with this, but one of them that I'm going to mention tonight is by using a web service called Mad Mimi. And these guys aren't, you know, they're not paying me anything to say this, but um, I want to give you guys a demo, because they are a web service, they're a paid web service, but they're freaking awesome, and I'm going to show you why. So in Mad Mimi, when I want to add a user to a mailing list, they have a very simple API. So they solve that problem for me. So I can say, you know, add tom at example.com to this particular list. So I just need to do a call, RESTful URL call. Um, I can also just use you know, these simple URLs. I can add a user, I can remove a user, I can even remove several users to a mailing list and add some CSV parameters. So I can just push them all there. What that means is now that the client, whenever they want to send out an email, they can go straight to Mad Mimi. And Mad Mimi is an email you know, marketing service that does all this sort of tracking stuff. So they can go straight to Mad Mimi, create these bulk emails that they want to send out to all the users, create it there, send it out, create the campaign there. Mad Mimi does all the tracking and everything. So I can have Mad them interface with Mad Mimi whenever they want to spam their users. And we don't have to worry about exporting any CSV files because we, we're keeping the whitelist pretty much on Mad Mimi. So that's the first cool thing about Mad Mimi. The second thing, which is where it gets really neat, is when it comes to client changes. So what we did with this project of mine, we had this situation here where we had a lot of emails inside of the Rails app. We took them, all these emails, and we put them 
inside of Mad Mimi. Mad Mimi calls emails promotions. So we recreated all of them, even like the welcome emails. All the emails that the system sends out, recreated them using the email builder inside Mad Mimi. Cool. So now, in our Ruby application, our Rails application, we just replace Action Mailer with the Mad Mimi gem. Mad Mimi is a Rails app, by the way, which is kind of neat. So we, we add the Mad Mimi gem. And now to send an email, this is all we do. So for our new account, we say, you know, from this, from this guy to that guy, here's the promotion name, which is the name of the email we created in Mad Mimi, and here's the subject line. And to make that email send, we simply say, deliver new account notification. It goes out to Mad Mimi, sends that email. I mean, that's, that's pretty sweet. And that, now I don't have to even deal with like SMTP servers and crap like that. Right? So the one thing you might be thinking at this point is, well, what about for dynamic emails? What if my, you know, what if I have like, I want to put the user's email inside of my emails? If my emails are going to be on somebody else's server, how do I deal with that? Well, Mad, Mad Mimi solves that as well using these sort of brackets like you see here. So if I've got name, email, account, all I have to do is this. It's going to wrap that up, send it over to Mad Mimi, populate the variables. So now, my client is much happier because every time they need to make a change, they go straight into Mad Mimi. Every time they need to make a grammar change or a spelling change, the client can go into Mad Mimi using their very user, easy user interface, make those small tweaks, don't have to bug me at all when they need to rearrange the emails. Oh, it's awesome, right? And so, yeah, so these are the uh, promotions inside Mad Mimi. Yeah, they can go right in here and they can edit, you know, the new user email, the forgot password email, anything that goes out. They can edit it right there. My client can edit it. So I did this with an application. It was going really well. And then all of a sudden, one day, I got this really awesome call from my client. I just couldn't believe this really happened. My client gave me a call. They said, OK, when somebody buys this item in the Rails app, I want this email to get sent out. And the email that I need to get sent out, I already created it for you in Mad Mimi. All you got to do is hook it up. So I went, I was like, damn, right? Seriously? So all I had to do is go into the Rails app, hook it up to Mad Mimi, and it was done. I mean, that was like, OK. The, the client did like half the work I would normally have to do for me because they created the email. So that's Mad Mimi. Um, you know, and I, a lot of the stuff that I talk about with the scalability has to do with you know, creating web services. So you can kind of think of this as another web service which can help you scale, right? Because you want to have, you know, obviously when you scale stuff out into big pieces, all the big you know, applications, whether it's Script D, they've ended up ha you know, splitting things out into components that are really focused on doing one thing. And really, this is one thing. This is doing, taking care of your emails so that you don't have to deal with it. If your system gets really big, you'll never have to deal with emails, and it's probably cheaper to pay them a subscription fee than it is to maintain that hardware, figure out how to do it, and hire someone to maintain it. So that's all that I said. So all these screencasts, um, as I mentioned, uh, if you go to this URL right here, you can get a really quick links to all of these items which I talked about. Um, also, if you want to see the screencasts again, they recently got posted up to the Scaling Rails screencast series, so they're on there. So you can show other people if you want to show somebody the screencast again or you want to watch it again. Um, yeah, uh, last bit I did want to mention before we do questions. If there's any speakers in this room, and I haven't gotten your 30 minutes, because you know I go around to the conferences and get all the speakers to give me their talks in 30 minutes, come find me. 30 if you 30 seconds, sorry. <laughs> I aggregate them all, and it's about 30 minutes. Um, and then also, um, I talked about Gowala at the beginning. Um, if any of you happen to be sticking around tomorrow, um, Nathaniel and I are going to be doing two trips. Basically, they have these cool things like where you check in at a bunch of locations and you get a badge for doing it, right? And so there's, in San Francisco, there's two. There's North Beach in going to some of the coolest places in North Beach. And then I think we're going to rent bikes and do the Golden Gate Gallop and go to all the coolest places along the water and across the Golden Gate Bridge, bridge renting bikes. So if any of you in here, feel free to come up if you want to join us. Come uh, talk to me. And I guess I uh, have maybe two minutes for questions. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, what, do you, what do you think is next with the, uh, what's the path going forward? 
what's not solved? Um, well, I think the most interesting bit going on right now is web services, right? I still think people aren't taking advantage of web services as much as we can, and I think Mad Mimi is a great example of that, right? If you have a web service for, like I know I've also heard of people doing like, uh, like MongoDB, like I think you can get MongoDB in the cloud as a web service, right? Um, so I think it'd be interesting to see what other components of our web applications people can create sort of cheap paid web services so that we can easily, we can scale easier by taking those sort of like background jobs that maybe we don't want to deal with or, you know, email in some shape or form and, you know, pushing that off to a separate web service that we might not have to deal with. So I think that's really interesting. Oh, and yeah, and if somebody creates that stuff, you know, we'll, we'll be bound to, you know, talk about it on Ruby 5. So listen to Ruby 5. Oh, also, if any of you guys sitting in the audience ever have any open source libraries or tools or gems you want to get publicity for, get the word out, um, send us an email because, you know, we love people emailing us stories and we typically cover what you send us unless it really sucks. Yeah. Um, so uh, just a comment. So the, another solution for memory profiling is to use RubyProf and patch Ruby, uh, which lets you do full line level profiling uh, and have like a cache grant interface on top of it. Yeah, uh, in case you guys couldn't hear him in the back, you say another way to do memory profiling is to use RubyProf with the Ruby patches on top of that. That's definitely one way to do it. Um, yeah. And also New Relic. I mean, New Relic RPM is really good for keeping an eye on all of your servers. None of the stuff that I mentioned here sort of is, a, is sort of like a replacement for that. I'm a big uh, New Relic RPM fan just for, for monitoring your servers. It's also really good, if you, especially if you start optimizing with memory stuff, because you can then go back and see, OK, a week ago, what do we look like? And today, what do we look like after the optimizations? They make it really easy to do that and compare results. Any other questions? Yeah? You know where uh, Scrooge stores the optimized queries? Does anybody know where Scrooge stores the optimized queries? Not offhand. Sorry. How it works with multiple databases. How it works with multiple databases. Well, I suspect what it's doing, and this is just me sort of just, you know, I suspect what it's doing is some form of uh, a little bit of metaprogramming, so that it's actually maybe writing some method definitions which get called. So I suspect it might not even matter what kind of database you're using, because it's actually writing out um, method calls. At least that makes sense to me. Any other questions? Are we good? All right. Thank you guys for the coming to the talk. I really appreciate it. And don't forget to check in at Zed Shaw's desk.